start by telling you about an experience I had. This was, um, it was over 10 years ago now. And I have been extremely ill. I've been overworking a great deal. I have a very, very bad chest infection. And I'd gone to sleep on my back. I was lying down on my back. I wasn't aware of actually going to sleep. I just kept coughing every time. I lost consciousness. And uh, I was pulled out of my body at great speed and just stood next to my body. And I was there looking at myself. Now, at that time in my life, this happened a lot, so I wasn't particularly panicked. And I turned around to the side and I saw my mum standing there. And at that point, she, um, she had been dead for 18 months. But at this point in my life, that happened a lot, so I wasn't there. And the, the only thing I could think to say to her was I was just like, oh, great to see you, it's fantastic. And then I looked down at my supine, ill body and I said to her, am I okay? I thought she'd come to get me. But um, in actual fact, oh, she, she hadn't. I just, I just went off. It was a normal out of body experience. And I had them a lot. And the thing is, I can totally sympathize with anybody who has had a lot of out of body experiences because they are hyper emotional. They're hyper real. They're incredibly, incredibly visceral. So I understand why people treat them actually as objectively real. Um, basically, I, I think that uh, it was Coslin and Koenig that defined the brain as, uh, the mind as what the brain does. So there's a very functional kind of a definition there. Um, and that's moving away from the old-fashioned Cartesian point of view that you know, you've got something, a ghost in the machine, something separate in there. Um, that actually we really do function through our, our biology. And it's more intuitive, really, perhaps, for us to feel that there is someone inside. Um, the easy problem defined by Chalmers was the easy problem of consciousness is finding out the neural correlates. With modern technology, we're getting really good at that. So we can observe, we're just beginning, we can observe how sensations are uh, linked to neurological phenomena. Uh, the hard problem is working out the subjectivity of how that actually gives rise to our own personal experience. Uh, I, I can describe the wavelength of red light, I can't necessarily describe what it is like to see red. So that's the explanatory gap that I think that we're trying to fill. Uh, in general, when it comes to evidence, I think the first thing to note is that human beings are remarkably bad witnesses. We see the world as it's useful to see it, rather than the way that it really is. Uh, we tend to see things that aren't there, we don't see things that are there. Um, our cognitive map of the world really does help to provide explanations to us. Uh, we can see things, we believe things according to their context. There was an experiment done by Wiseman et al. in Hampton Court Palace. And they asked people about spooky experiences when they'd been around. And the people who already believed in ghosts, guess what, sensed the ghosts in the spooky palace. So it was that their schema, their ideas of how the world already worked, just fed into their perceptions. Uh, there's top-down cognitive processing whereby your, your prior perceptions of, of the world can actually, um, your prior ideas about how the world works can affect your perceptions. So we're not brilliant witnesses. Uh, we're very good at seeing things that actually aren't there. And I would like to ask if any of you have woken up in the middle of the night, you were probably sleeping on your backs, maybe not, and you couldn't move, and you correctly interpreted the surroundings, you weren't in a dream, you were possibly very, very fearful, and there might have been something else in the room with you. Have any of you had that? Because I certainly have. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely typical kind of show about 40% whenever I ask that question. And um, how many of you put your hands back up if you knew then or have subsequently found out actually what it is? Not so many. Uh, sleep paralysis is basically a sleep blip. It isn't harmful. It can feel profoundly harmful. And if you didn't have uh, a rational explanation for it, it could make you believe in ghosts. And I did for years. I uh, speak to Carla over there, I saw her earlier, um, and she's had a lot of sleep paralysis too. So that's been studied a great deal. People who suffer from sleep paralysis, um, it can happen once and then just go away, or it can happen a few times, uh, it can happen chronically in some people. It tends to be just a phase in life, and it's, it's a sleep blip, as I say, it's harmless, and you can learn to get over it. But if you want to push through and encourage it a bit more, and if you are, uh, if you are, are predisposed to get it, then you can push through, you can concentrate, you can meditate, you can do the stuff you're supposed to, and you can go into lucid dreams, 
lucid dreaming, out of body experiences. Um, and I, I think basically we're looking at the same kind of underlying neurological stuff there. Uh, there's, there's out of body experiences, it does correlate statistically with lucid dreaming, false awakenings, that kind of thing. Um, the near death experiences, the researchers have mentioned that people who have near death experiences, that the physical correlates are probably the same for out of body experiences. So we're looking at a cluster of very similar things that have the same underlying neurology. Sam Pania, who's a critical medical specialist, said, pointed out that death is not a moment but a process. So if people, he's working on brilliant work, actually, where he's working on cooling people who've had traumatic injuries and then trying to pull them back because he recognises that people can be pulled back a bit further from death than was previously thought if their, cell, if their cells don't degrade. So it could be that near-death experiences are just in the same cluster of perfectly normal neurological activity. Um, those are the types of, th sorry, okay, yeah. maybe they're, those are the types of things that are used uh, as proof that we can really extend our consciousness beyond the body, uh, including, there's another one, remote viewing or clairvoyance, as it was previously called before they tried to make it respectable in the 1970s. Um, the, the people will argue backwards and forwards about precise papers, what everybody says, but there are not many scientists who seriously, seriously believe that the, the statistics stand up. Um, basically, if we, if we go into the physics of this, I would like to emphasise that putting quantum in a sentence doesn't mean insert wish list here. <laughs> and just because we don't understand something, it doesn't mean to say that we can just jam in something that we would love to understand. When, at the beginning of understanding electricity and magnetism, Anton Mesmer was sticking people in pools of water and putting magnetised iron rods in there to try and cure them of all sorts of illnesses. Now, of course, electricity and magnetism absolutely exist. He was totally wrong. You can't just pour one thing into another simply because you don't know enough about it. Um, and just to finish off, I would like to tell you about a final experience that I had. You've heard about me being pulled out of my body. You've heard about me getting, uh, seeing my dead mother. I'd also like to tell you about when uh, I woke up, I was lying on my back, and I looked towards the door. And do any of you remember in the 70s the Cadbury Smash Robots? The, the, the metallic things? Um, God knows why that was a decade when no one could be bothered to mash their own bloody potatoes. <laughs> How lazy do you have to be? But there was a whole ad campaign, and I was filled with fear, as you often are in sleep paralysis. And there were two Cadbury smash robots there going like this. <laughs> so if we are to take these phenomena as just independently verifiable, as um, verifiable basically at face value, then we must look at my mother coming back to speak to me, and we must also look at Cadbury smash robots. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone.